Get ready to fall in love with a brand new story. So sit back and relax. The scene begins with the introduction of our protagonist, Kim Siu Jun, who is 27 years old. He tells us that he is a natural awakener and was born with stronger abilities than others. In order to pay off his family's debts resulting from a mysterious accident that claimed their lives, he has been working in monster transportation for nine years. However, there is another dream he is pursuing, becoming a pro hunter. As Kim takes a break, his co-workers ask him if he has been saving money to become a hunter. Kim replies that he is searching for a cheap but good hunter academy. Another person asks if becoming a hunter is as prestigious as awakening, to which the one mentions that attending hunter academies is a must now, as over 50 years have passed since the creation of the pro hunter exam. Kim agrees with this argument as most of the professors at hunter academies are active and return hunters. Real hunters can teach you the experiences and know-how that they would normally have to risk their lives to learn. As a result, a significant gap has formed between the educated and the uneducated. Kim has managed to save up $40,000 to attend one year of classes at a hunter academy. As he scrolls through his mobile phone, a strange ad about the Transcension Academy appears on the screen. Kim wonders about it as he has never heard of it before. When he watches the promotional video, it is filled with praise for the company, guaranteeing the success of students. They claim to have a collection of experienced professors and offer customized individual tasks for each student. The ad shows reviews from students who claim that their lives have taken a turning point because of the Transcension Academy. Kim finds it all weird and thinks of it as some sort of scam. He notices the names of the teachers mentioned, like Buna and Hercules, as basic teachers. Master Sun Wukong gives Kim a basic introduction to spear technique, which Kim finds to be a basic combat skill. However, when Sun Wukong demonstrates his powers by making an entire giant mountain disappear with a thud from his spear, Kim can't believe his eyes. Such an act is impossible even for S-class hunters. After that, the website asks Kim to register so that he can obtain the Great Sage. As he taps to register, the site prompts him to create an account and notifies him that there will be a membership fee. Taking casualties into account, the registration fee amount comes out to $40,000. Kim curses them and calls them scammers. He then proceeds to work, and his fellow worker asks him which academy he is considering for registration. Kim replies that he has been thinking about the Air K Hunter Academy because he heard they have good teachers. While they discuss monsters and such, a giant monster behind Kim is lifted using a crane. Suddenly, due to the heaviness of the monster, the chain breaks and falls down and Kim is right beneath it. The scene cuts and Kim's name echoes in the air. As the scene shifted in the hospital, where Kim lay injured, the doctor informed him that the nerves in his legs were undergoing necrosis. The bones had become entangled with the nerves during the healing process. The doctor mentioned that Kim, being an awakener, with faster regeneration, needed surgery, which would cost $40,000. It was crucial for him to undergo the surgery as soon as possible to ensure a better future. Stunned and lying in his bed, Kim wondered how he would face the future after enduring such a long and difficult journey. He felt frustrated because he had spent all his savings on the surgery, leaving him with only $3,000, which Mr. Manchel had given him. He questioned himself if he could go through a similar situation again. Lost in deep thought, Kim's phone rang and he received a notification from a website offering him a free pass if he registered immediately. As Kim picked up his phone, he realized that he might not find such an opportunity again after that day. To his surprise, the website recalculated the registration fee to be $3,000, the exact amount he had left. Kim pondered on the fact that the registration cost was $40,000 previously. He realized that the site was asking for everything he had. As Kim contemplated registering, he realized he had very little money left in his account. However, the moment he completed the registration process, an astonishing occurrence unfolded before his eyes. The money inside the envelope that Mr. Manchel had given him began to levitate and fly out, as if responding to the registration. Simultaneously, the website congratulated him for becoming a member of the Transcension Academy. In the midst of this extraordinary event, a radiant light manifested in front of Kim, leaving him utterly stunned. From within the brilliance, a figure emerged, introducing himself as Kim's mentor. The man proclaimed that his name was Mentor Mentor. Overwhelmed with shock, Kim questioned whether his mentor's actual name was truly Mentor. The mentor affirmed that he was indeed Kim's mentor, and his name was Mentor. Kim inquired if he was the same mentor he knew and mentioned Odysseus as teacher. The mentor acknowledged the familiarity and proudly stated that Odysseus had been his first student, adding that it had been a long time since Odysseus had become a transcendent. He mentioned that they still occasionally kept in touch, leaving Kim astonished by his words. Moving on from that conversation, the mentor redirected the topic and explained that the Transcend Academy was designed to teach those who aspired to become transcendent beings. This prompted Kim to question whether it wasn't an academy for hunters. 
In response, the mentor asked how they could be compared to hunters and confidently claimed that with their guidance, they could take down hunters effortlessly using only their fingers. He then handed Kim a form to fill out, an aptitude test to determine the field of transcendence he wished to pursue. As Kim selected the combat specialist field in the form, he encountered confusion when the second question asked about his current power level. None of the criteria listed matched his abilities. Observing Kim's perplexity, the mentor expressed disbelief that he couldn't even lift a mountain. Nevertheless, the mentor reassured him that the Transcend Academy would never reject a member and encouraged him to continue answering the questions. After what felt like an eternity, Kim finally completed the form, feeling dizziness from the 198 questions. The mentor informed him that he had earned a free pass and recommended some lectures for him to attend. As the mentor analyzed Kim's answers, taking into account his preference for combat and spearmanship, Kim wondered if the Heaven's Great Sage Field would be too advanced for him, considering he could move mountains. The site recommended a lecture by Siddharth Gautama based on Kim's physical abilities. The mentor questioned why Kim hadn't started with Siddharth Gautama's lecture, considering his injuries and emotional troubles. He explained that Siddharth Gautama was a renowned instructor, and his lecture was a required subject for the transcension exam. The site sent a notification urging Kim to register for the lecture, emphasizing that it would provide him with an unwavering heart, which the mentor deemed crucial for breaking through most transcension fields. The mentor also mentioned that even if Kim feel like he is losing his mind, he would still have to watch the lecture alone. Kim inquired about losing his mind, to which the mentor replied that Kim would understand once he took the class. The mentor then disappeared, stating that he would contact Kim after analyzing his profile. With the mentor gone, Kim contemplated watching the video lecture. The video began with God and Buddha questioning the existence of the world, leaving Kim wondering if he was the real Buddha. As the lecture progressed, Kim found it challenging and started to realize his place in the world, contemplating his eventual demise and the absence of his existence. With each passing moment, his understanding deepened, but it also made him feel as if he were losing his mind. The scene then shifted to the next week, where the doctor was astonished by Kim's remarkable recovery. Despite being an awakener, the doctor had never witnessed such a recovery in his 30 years of practice. Kim attributed his improved condition to Gautam Buddha's lecture, which had brought tranquility to his heart and sped up his healing process. He realized that he was currently only at 1.3% of his potential and wondered what would happen when he completed the lecture. Considering his newfound mobility, Kim decided to explore Chiron's lecture. Upon reading the description, he discovered that upon completion, he would obtain Metamorphosis, A. As Kim lay down, contemplating the A-class Metamorphosis, he acknowledged that while it might be a lower class compared to the unwavering heart, it was still a valuable skill. As he began the lecture, a centaur named Chiron appeared and introduced himself. Kim remembered that Chiron had been the teacher of heroes like Hercules, Achilles, and Jason in Greek mythology. The lecture commenced with Chiron stating that combat techniques would not be taught in depth. Suddenly, Chiron's mood shifted, and he screamed at Kim to wake up and move. The abrupt change left Kim stunned, jolting him awake from his bed. As Kim fell off the bed, the sight prompted him with a daily individual task, calculating his level and suggesting a suitable physical task. Looking at the task, he wondered if it exceeded the daily difficulty and decided to follow the doctor's advice to rest and focus on listening to the lectures until his discharge. However, as he was about to resume the lecture, the site notified him to complete the daily task. Kim repeatedly pressed the button to skip it, but the site insisted that he needed to complete it. Frustrated, Kim wondered how the site knew he hadn't finished the task as he had been trying the whole day. Eventually, he accepted his defeat and realized that he should watch Gautam Buddha's lecture instead. As Kim prepared to continue watching the lecture, he noticed an expiration date displayed on the page. The scene shifted, showing Kim running and crying upon realizing that there was an expiration date for the free pass. He sat on a beach, contemplating that the pass must have had a 90-day expiration period, with only 83 days remaining. He understood that he had to absorb the lecture content fully to make progress. However, when he checked his progress, it was still stuck at 1.3% despite attending the lectures repeatedly. Kim lost confidence in completing the lecture within the remaining 83 days. Getting ready for training, Kim pondered how he could fit it into his schedule. He thought about the time he spent exercising, carrying monsters hurt by pro hunters, each weighing around 70 kilos and didn't feel like doing separate exercises. He began doing push-ups and easily completed 300 of them, feeling satisfied. However, when he opened the site to see his progress, he was furious to discover that the push-ups only counted as 81. Kim wondered why this happened and realized it was due to improper form. Determined, he redid everything with proper form, pouring out his sweat and tears. He concluded his workout with a 30 kilometers run, leaving him exhausted and lying on the road, crying.
He realized that he had to repeat this routine every day, and he wondered when he would find time to listen to the lectures. As the scene shifted a few days later, Kim visited his aunt's house. Upon seeing his physique, she praised him and asked if he was going out to exercise again. Kim confirmed that he had been working out recently. Suddenly, the news on the TV caught everyone's attention. The headline reported that a four-star monster behemoth had appeared in the city. The news stated that the monster had been in a deep sleep but woke up within the inner city. However, before the situation could worsen, an Awakener in the city stepped up and prevented any loss of life. It was mentioned that the Awakener was from the Gone Academy. Aunt praised the Awakener, referring to them as grand people, and asked Kim why he didn't tell her that he was an Awakener too. Kim replied affirmatively and Aunt wondered if they would see him on TV one day when he became a hunter. Feeling nervous, Kim asked Aunt if she thought just anyone could appear on TV. Suddenly, Uncle rudely interjected, stating that these days becoming a pro hunter was very difficult. Aunt realized that it wasn't like before during her time. Uncle went on to tell Kim that he wasn't even a cadet yet, and if he was exercising with the hope of becoming a hunter, he should give up. Kim's anger welled up as he recalled all the hardships he had endured over the last nine years. Aunt scolded Uncle for being so rude. In a burst of frustration, Kim shouted that he would decide what he wanted to do with his life, prompting Uncle to become even more furious. Kim told Uncle to worry about his own life first, and he stormed out of the place in anger, firmly believing that he was a cadet of the Transcension Academy. Motivated to become a pro hunter, Kim started running with the determination to become one someday. The scene then shifted to a different location where a lady expressed her hatred for being a hunter. She had just finished fighting a fierce monster, effortlessly dispatching it with a single slash of her sword. Despite her victory, she displayed disappointment in being a hunter, mentioning that it still cost them money and she didn't have any cadets to assist her. She was clearly annoyed. As the scene shifted to Kim's room, he collapsed onto his bed, utterly exhausted. He had been living in the hospital for the past two weeks and was loving being back. Lying there, he contemplated the fact that he only had one year left until the hunter's exam. He also realized that he had no money left in his account. Waking up, he checked the progress on the site and saw that it prompted him to proceed to the next lesson. A greeting, Kim found himself face to face with Chiron, who entered the room and remarked that Kim finally had enough strength to start toddling. This realization made Kim feel like he was still a baby. Chiron then introduced the second phase of the lesson, emphasizing that the first step to becoming transcendent is developing one's sense. The scene shifted to the next morning as Kim arrived at his workplace. His boss warned him that if another unsavory incident were to occur, it would be Kim's neck on the line. Kim thought to himself that he didn't want to be here either, but he had no choice because he needed to earn money to feed him. Despite the warning, the boss allowed Kim to continue working. Sitting there, Kim contemplated his financial situation. If he didn't work, he wouldn't have enough money to eat. But if he focused on making money, he wouldn't have enough time to listen to the lectures. Kim considered reviewing the lesson while at work and tried to remember what Charon had taught him during the last lesson. He recalled that it was about developing his sense. Just then, Manchel approached from behind, seemingly about to give him a friendly slap on the back. Kim instinctively dodged the slap, leaving both of them confused. Manchel asked how Kim was able to do that and jokingly questioned if Kim had eyes on the back of his head. Afterward, Manchel instructed Kim to get back to work. As the scene shifted, Manchel asked Kim if he would be able to carry three monsters with him, as their combined weight exceeded 200 kilograms. Kim confidently replied that he would be all right, and he started moving, carrying parts of the monsters. Manchel observed Kim's walking and concluded that he must be fine. Kim found it strange that he suddenly felt a burst of strength within him. He decided to prioritize the daily tasks since he wouldn't have enough time after work. Kim began doing squats, and after completing a single squat, he couldn't resist checking his progress. To his shock, he discovered that the squat count had increased by plus three with just one squat. Kim realized that it was due to the increased effectiveness with more weight. While he was still figuring it out, Manchel advised him to take a break. Kim was fully pumped up by this realization and took over the load Manchel was carrying. He thought that he no longer needed separate training sessions for the tasks. He started doing push-ups, believing that the heavier the weight, the higher the count would increase, which meant he could earn more money and save time. He considered it a perfect example of hurt two birds with one stone. As the evening passed, Kim returned to his room exhausted but realizing the efficiency of multitasking work and tasks despite the challenges. He expressed gratitude for being able to exercise during work, which saved him time. By 10 p.m., he had completed both the tasks and the lecture, feeling satisfied with finishing early. He then considered reviewing another lecture and chose one included in the free pass. When he clicked on the lecture, the site provided a brief description, stating that he could become strong enough to pull mountains from the ground, with Xiang Yu as the instructor. Kim wondered if it referred to the hegemon king Xiang Yu. Kim mentioned that after appearing in The Legend of Chu and Han, 
He became a man with overwhelming power. He didn't find it bad and registered for the lecture. When the lecture started, Xiang Yu laughed, calling those who took the lecture trash and claimed they didn't even know the basics. Despite insulting him, Xiang Yu agreed to teach Kim how to swing spears. Emphasizing the importance of carving the concept of the spear into his body and senses, he instructed Kim to return to him after achieving that. Then the site notified Kim about his daily tasks, which included swinging the spear 5,000 times. Kim felt depressed and commented on how Shang Yu just ended the lecture with a few words. The scene shifted to the next day where the girl encountered earlier introduced herself as B-Class Hunter Park Siyun. She mentioned the recent behemoth incident and expressed her desire to thoroughly inspect the situation feeling like she might have missed something. The workers observed their boss nearly bowing down to her and wondered about her identity. One of the workers mentioned that she was the granddaughter of the Sword Star. Kim paused upon hearing that title, recalling Park Minchel, the Sword Star, who was an awakener and active during the early stages of gate creation. As Kim mentioned, monsters used to be extremely brutal, roaming the streets and human survival wasn't guaranteed. As he further praised Park Minchel, he mentioned that Minchel was active as an awakener during that time, and was one of the people who helped restore civilization to the world. He concluded that Minchel was the savior of the world, a true hero. Despite the passing of time, Minchel, even as an old man, remained a heavyweight and continued to compete on the global stage. After all that, Kim thought that it was not his business and he should focus on his training. He was carrying a giant monster and squatting when Suyum saw him and asked about him. The boss told her not to mind him as he had been like this for a week. Kim felt something was wrong with the monster's head, but he kept counting. Then he placed the corpse near Minchel, who asked him how long he would be training. Kim replied that if he had started, he should see it through to the end, and he started counting again, realizing there was meaning in this. As he was about to leave, Minchel sighed, and suddenly the monster moved and awakened, spreading its giant wings. Minchel was just below the monster and about to be attacked when Kim screamed his name. The scene shifted to some time before the monsters awakened. Suyun was standing, finally able to escape from the boss of the workers. She wondered how long she had to deal with him. Some workers passing by whispered to each other, asking if the girl was the granddaughter of the Sword Star. Sue even heard their words, but in her heart, she felt that being the Sword Star's granddaughter was more of a burden than a title of honor. She had been directly taught by the Sword Star since she could walk, but the wall of the Sword Star's reputation was high, and she couldn't overcome it. She was endlessly compared to her grandfather. She mentioned that her original dream was to be an educator, but when she shared that with her grandfather, he simply dismissed her. Because of her grandfather, she couldn't live a normal life. And even when she compromised and started the Hunter Academy, the cadets joined in the hope of being instructed by the Sword Star. But when they realized it was her and that the Sword Star had no role in it, they left the Academy. To Su Yum, it was all because of the Sword Star. As she walked outside, contemplating the unknown fate of her Academy and wishing for at least one proper cadet, chaos awaited her. The workers were running as the monster awakened. The scene then shifted to Kim standing and Manchul lying under the monster in grave danger. Manchul screamed at Kim to escape and leave them behind. Kim hesitated, realizing that if he left, they would die. Thoughts raced through his mind, acknowledging that a normal person couldn't overcome a monster and even an awakener who couldn't use manises in the same boat. The Manticore, a formidable five-star monster, was a challenge even for elite hunters. Kim thought about Park Suyun, but she was nowhere to be found. Realizing that time was running out and someone needed to take action, he said to himself that someone had to move to save Manchel. Fearfully, he asked himself who it would be. As the Manticore turned furious and prepared to attack Manchul, Kim grabbed his steel pipe and swung at the monster, causing it to step back. Kim screamed at Manchul to run, understanding that he had to stall for time until the professional hunter arrived. As Kim trembled with fear, hesitating and screaming in his mind, telling himself to move, suddenly the sound of God and Buddha's voice echoed in the area, calming the tense situation and allowing him to understand the situation with a cold mind. The fear dissipated and Kim strode towards the Manticore. The manticore swung his paw to attack him, but he remembered Chiron's lesson and decided to rely on his sixth sense. He skillfully dodged the manticore's attack and continued to use his sixth sense, jumping into the air and identifying the creature's weak points. However, for a moment, he was blank, unsure of what to do. Then the lesson of Xiang Yu resurfaced in his mind, where Xiang Yu had said that uprooting mountains wasn't just about strength. It was about momentum and trusting in one's own ability to split the mountain. With this knowledge, Kim gripped his steel pipe, believing that he could split the manticore. Using all his power, he swung the steel pipe, and the manticore let out a piercing scream as it was cleaved in two. The sound echoed through the air, leaving everyone in the vicinity wondering what had transpired. Sunyun rushed towards the scene, and as the dust settled, Kim emerged and the manticore lay split in two. It was evident that his progress and the lessons on the site had significantly increased after this encounter. 
Styrian was stunned, wondering what had happened. She couldn't believe that someone who wasn't even a hunter had defeated the Manticore with just a steel pipe. As Lin rushed towards Manchul to inquire about his injuries, Suyun glanced at Kim. Everyone around them praised Kim and Suyun overheard Raju saying that she had found what she needed. The scene shifted to the evening, when everyone headed home. Kim looked at the site and noticed that the progress rate had increased significantly compared to just listening to the lectures repeatedly. He realized that capturing the Manticore had likely contributed to this progress. He quoted, A hundred words aren't worth a single picture, suggesting that practical application of the skills in actual combat was the best way to enhance lecture progress. However, he faced a problem. He couldn't enter the Hunter Academy to obtain a temporary license or participate in dungeon raids. As Ken walked, contemplating whether he needed to gather money and apply to become a hunter, Suyun called him from behind and asked for some time to chat. Kim wondered why she wanted to talk to him. When he asked her to speak, Suyun straightforwardly and passionately asked if he wanted to meet her grandfather. Kim declined and continued walking, which made Suyun angry. However, she composed herself and walked behind him, deciding to wait. Suyun was nervous as she had never experienced this kind of situation in her 31 years and felt a bit flustered. Kim asked if she wanted him to join her hunter academy, which currently had no cadets. Seeing his peculiar exercises and considering that he had managed to defeat a two-star monster in a severely weakened state, slicing the four-star manticore in half, Suyun concluded that he was genuinely determined to become a hunter. As Suyun tried to convince him, saying that they had all the equipment, Kim declined, stating that he didn't want the instructions of a hunter academy. This greatly angered Suyun, so she asked him what if her grandfather of the sword star were to teach him. However, Kim remained firm and said that it didn't matter to him. Suyun was stunned to hear that he could even reject an offer to learn from the Sword Star, something that all pro hunters would desire. She realized that she couldn't just let him go and ask Kim how he planned to join the raids. She explained that he couldn't join a raid unless he was from a hunter academy and questioned if it wasn't a waste. Kim replied that it would be the same if he entered her academy because only the government had the authority to distribute temporary licenses. Suyun mentioned that they had that authorization and if he joined the academy, it would help him start raiding right away. Noticing that Kim's walking pace had slowed, Suyu knew she needed to push him now. She proposed that since he didn't need the academy's instructions, they would not interfere with him and provide separate training locations. After thinking for a moment, she offered him the deal that they wouldn't ask for payment. Hearing this, Kim found it to be a good deal and inquired what she wanted him to do in return. Suyun replied that she simply wanted him to pass the pro hunter exams and participate in several competitions under their academy's name. Additionally, wherever he went, he should let others know that he attended their academy. Kim considered it a tempting offer, realizing that it could solve all the concerns he had. He asked Suyun why she was going to such great lengths to get him to join. Suyun replied that she saw his potential. Kim smiled and shook hands with her as they introduced themselves. The scene shifted to the next day when Kim's phone rang. It was Manchul calling, asking if Kim had done something yesterday because their work leader had suddenly changed. Kim remembered that he had asked Suyun to request the company to replace the leader. He replied to Manchul that it might have been him who resigned due to the responsibilities from the accident. Manchul responded that it was a good thing, and he asked if Kim was on his way to the Hunter Academy. As he arrived at the Hunter Academy, Suyun waved at him and handed him the temporary Hunter's license. Kim wondered if they really issued it for him. He thought to himself that even though he hadn't become a pro Hunter yet, it felt like taking his first step towards his dream. He asked Suyun if she could teach him the method of dungeon raiding. Styrian responded that there was no need for that and asked him to choose a comfortable training station. She mentioned that they could start right away. After some time, Suyun mentioned that she had made an appointment for a raid. As they entered the dungeon, stone rat monsters appeared and Kim easily defeated them. He asked Suyun why she was following him into the dungeon when they had agreed not to meddle with each other. Suyun asked him to think about it, as they could save each other and only the academy would be helpful. Kim agreed and Suyun told him that since it was his first time in a dungeon, he should think of her as a safety device. Kim considered himself lucky that his attacks were effective even without using mana. Originally, they were normal attacks without mana. As they moved forward, a monster rat woke up and was about to attack Kim. Kim sensed it and struck hard, wondering how his attacks were effective even though he couldn't use mana. He also noticed that the progress of the lecture was increasing, but not as drastically as with the manticore yesterday. Suyun was stunned to see him in action as many monsters were coming towards Kim. He was enjoying it and felt like he was grinding for experience in a game. As the scene shifted after they returned from the dungeon, Kim was attending the lecture. Suyun found him to be peculiar. Whenever he returned from a dungeon raid, he would just stare at the blank screen. 
Suyun's thoughts reveal that others couldn't see the trance in lectures. She wondered how Kim, who didn't have a proper education, could massacre monsters like hunters who had training for over 10 years. She also found his strange exercises like carrying the corpses and dismantling them himself rather unconventional. She mused that he could have simply called a corpse delivery service, but speculated that he might be trying to save on expenses. She realized that she couldn't hide the fact that she had a new cadet from her grandfather. The scene shifted to Kim, who was happy upon seeing his account balance. He had earned a substantial amount in a single day and felt proud of himself. He attributed his success to moving and dismantling corpses, believing there was a point to all his efforts. However, he recognized that the problem was the amount of time and effort required for that work. He also hadn't finished yesterday's lesson. Kim considered asking Manchul from work to join him, thinking it could be a way to save time. He planned to contact Manchul when he had the chance. He wondered how he could wisely use the money he had earned. He remembered that the dungeon raid had helped increase his lecture points, but not as quickly as when he defeated the last monster. In fact, his lecture points hadn't increased at all. As he pondered on faster methods to become stronger, aiming to be as powerful as Sun Wukong, Kim suddenly realized that the lecture he had seen was just a sneak peek. He hadn't been able to attend the class due to lack of money. Determined, he now opened the paid lecture of the Heaven's Great Sage, which promised to teach him the techniques of the Great Sage DGP. However, as he saw the price of the lecture, his enthusiasm turned to shock. It amounted to $27 million. Kim sat down on the road, feeling broken and unable to fathom handling such a colossal sum of money, even after becoming a professional. He decided to forget about it for now and deal with it later. He wondered if the Transcend Academy sold any items since he couldn't attend the lectures. He found the auction he was looking for and was stunned to see the Elixir Aegis Shield, an extraordinary mythical level equipment, even though they were just copies. His eyes gleamed with excitement at the prospect of easily obtaining such a powerful weapon. He pressed the purchase button, and the system calculated the appropriate price. The scene shifted to Kim vigorously counting something engrossed in his task. Su Yuan arrived, observing him doing push-ups and remarked that he seemed more desperate today. She asked if anything had happened. Kim reflected on the previous night, realizing that he had expected the price to be high, considering that copies would still be worth millions in real life. However, he was stunned to see that even a price of one million was burdensome. He couldn't fathom when he would be able to afford the $27 million lecture. Su Yun then asked him about the academic contention, and Kim admitted that he had heard about it, but didn't know the details. Su Yun explained that it was a contest between academies where numerous institutions competed to showcase their supremacy. She handed him a file to evaluate an academy's level. As she explains to him that the academic contention is at the first level, and if he performs well, he can earn the right to participate in the higher league, which will help increase the academy's applicants and gain authorization from the government. Kim said that if she's protesting to him, does she want him to participate? Steryun said that's exactly what she wanted to represent their Hunter's Academy in the contest. Kim realizes that if he wins, his lecture progress might be raised. He accepts the offer, stating that it was part of their agreement, and asks what they usually do during the contention. Suyun replies that she doesn't know the exact details, but it involves combining scores from dungeon raids and the cadet tournament. Kim hears this and says to himself that his battle experience against monsters is limited to just a manticore and those rat monsters. He has no experience fighting against other cadets and wonders if there is anyone who can challenge him. He looks at Suyun and asks if she would like to spar with him. It is clear that Kim forces her to spar with him, and as she takes the wooden sword, Kim thinks to himself that it's a great opportunity, even though she's just a B-rank hunter. However, she was taught by the sword star, and he is curious about how strong Suyun really is. Suyun asks him if he really wants to do it, knowing that she's a B-rank hunter. Kim agrees and tells her to go easy on him. She tells him to attack first, and Kim doesn't refuse. He strides towards her to attack, but in that moment, Suyun feels that his approach is fat and sloppy, and his next move is predictable. She is disappointed and realizes that she overestimated him. She decides to put her mana into her sword, thinking that with this attack, it'll be all over. As she attacks Kim, she is shocked to see that he blocks the blow containing mana. She wonders how he can block such an attack when the weapon should have been deflected out of his hands. Student plans to put the sword at his neck, but Kim takes a step back and is enthusiastic about the blow, remarking that it's real. The scene unfolded with Kim and Suyun engaged in a spar. Suyu noticed that Kim's momentum had suddenly shifted, becoming faster and sharper. Meanwhile, Kim was fully immersed in the fight, recalling the words of Xiang Yu echoing in his mind. Xiang Yu's advice urged him to make obvious attacks and defenses to understand his opponent. Following this guidance, Kim continued to battle Suyu, repeating the process of swinging his spear and observing her reactions, searching for the moment when she couldn't block and then launching a real attack. Xiang Yu's words motivated him to put his all into the next strike. 
As Kim swung his spear, he saw an opening and prepared to strike. However, Sue even sensed the danger and suddenly found herself standing, unable to grasp what had just happened. Realizing that she had used her full power without thinking, she asked Kim if he was all right. Kim, smiling, stood up and admitted that he had indeed lost. Sue even wondered if he had truly believed he could win. Kim to himself acknowledged that even in a contest between a B-rank hunter and a cadet, a hunter would always be a hunter. It was a completely different experience from fighting a monster. Reflecting on the disparity between an orc and a hunter, Kim realized he still had a long way to go. Observing his progress and how it was increasing as he had predicted, Kim realized that the system wanted him to have various experiences. He told Suyum that she had nothing to do until the tournament and asked if they could continue sparring during that time. Sue even contemplated the fact that despite the potential for serious injury from her mistake, he was requesting to spar again. Recognizing his dedication and hard work, she promised to help him and accepted to do everything he asked. She even offered that if he won, she would give him all the prize money. As Kim asked about the prize money, Sue even confirmed that it was natural for a competition to have one. When Kim inquired about the amount, Sue even speculated that it might be around $1 million. Hearing this, Kim became filled with eagerness, his eyes glancing at the lance of Longinus, and he grew more excited about the tournament. He eagerly asked for the details, and Suryun informed him that there were still two weeks left until the tournament. Kim's eyes lit up with excitement as he requested the sandbags to practice. Suryun directed him to use the bags in the corner, and Kim, fueled by his enthusiasm, set his sights on winning the $1 million. The scene then shifted to the day of the tournament after two weeks had passed. A person wearing a green shirt entered the tournament venue observing the crowded atmosphere and wondering about the place. It was a rare sight to see hunters fighting each other. The person searched for the waiting room as they were participating in the tournament. Upon entering the player's waiting room, he saw numerous confident contestants from different academies, each adorned with sparkling equipment and boasting impressive muscles. Dot his eyes caught sight of Kim, who was casually holding his spear and dressed in casual clothes. The observer speculated that Kim might be from a less prestigious academy attempting to make a name for them. He felt a sense of pity for Kim, assuming he must have been forced to participate in the tournament, and wondered why he had joined such an academy. As the person made fun of Kim, suggesting that he should pack his bags and go home, assuming he was just pretending to be busy on his phone, the person thought about talking to Kim. He approached Kim, greeted him, introduced him as Li Ming. Li asked if Kim was here to participate in the tournament. Kim confirmed and introduced himself to Li. Li asked if he could sit next to Kim, and Kim allowed him to do so. Li pointed towards a contestant and identified him as Jang Dukshul, a hopeless case from the Gokshuri Academy. Li mentioned that Jang specialized in using an axe as his main weapon and was typically a power type. Meanwhile, Jang was having an argument with Li Chomin, an affiliate of the Mint Academy. Li informed Kim that he had heard that Chomin was a bit unusual and used Twin Dagger as his weapons. Kim wondered why Li was explaining all this to him, even though he hadn't asked for it. Kim commented that Li seemed to know a lot about others. Li replied that he was simply interested. Suddenly, the affiliate from the Revenant Academy, Li Junwen, shouted at both Jang and Chomin to shut up, reminding them that they weren't the only ones in the waiting room. Everyone became quiet with just one sentence from Li Junwen. Li Mei informed Kim that he was a hopeful from the Revenant Academy and the winner of the Academy contention. Kim asked if Li was a strong candidate. They explained that he originally hadn't planned to participate because he considered the competition weak, but something must have happened in his academy to make him join. He was confident that he would win. Kim then asked Lee if he knew the Sword Star. As Lee informed Kim that the rumor was his granddaughter had scouted him, Kim was stunned to hear this. Lee mentioned that he didn't know why Kim rejected her, but it must be because he was confident in himself. Meanwhile, Jung was angry about having to participate in the tournament with what he considered to be trash. He thought to himself that if he had known, he would have accepted the girl's proposal and used her connections as the granddaughter of the Sword Star to his advantage. Jun's attention suddenly shifted to Kim's appearance, and he wondered about Kim's identity, cursing his luck that even someone like Kim was participating. Then the announcements were made, signaling them to finish their preparations. Kim stood up thinking about how he had prepared for the past two weeks with the goal of increasing his progress level to above 30%. Although he didn't feel a sudden increase in power, he could still sense the difference even between 19% and 20%. He concluded that with this supplementation of dungeon raids and sparring with Suyun, he would have no issues, whether it was monster hunting or duels. Determined to claim the one million prize, Kim readied himself as the first match, the dungeon maze race commenced. As the scene shifted before the tournament started outside the stadium, a person named Sunbai arrived. A man with a camera called out to him as Sunbai asked him that why he had chosen seats in the corner. Sunbai made his way there and accidentally bumped into a lady. After apologizing, he looked at her closely 
and the man asked if she was someone he knew. Sunbai replied that she looked familiar and asked for details about the first round of the tournament. The scene then shifted to the middle of the maze run, where the announcement was made that attacking others would be allowed. The contestants wondered if this low-level competition could be left to luck, as the maze contained monsters that provided hints and collecting those hints could lead to escaping the maze. Possible spectators watched the contestants and Sunbai commented that this time there were quite skilled students. The other man pointed out Jun, who effortlessly slashed a monster, earning praise from everyone. Soon was present, hiding her identity and watching the match. She saw Jun and became worried about why he was there. When she accidentally made a noise, Sunbai looked in her direction. She tried to remain calm, not wanting others to discover her and wonder how Kin was doing. Meanwhile, inside the maze, Kin was trying to figure out what to do. He attempted to break through a wall but couldn't, so he decided to take the normal path. Kim started walking, utilizing the left-hand technique and reached a three-way fork. He contemplated using the basic rule of keeping his hand on one side and continuing in that direction. However, he suddenly felt something unusual about the left path and had an incredible feeling that he should take the opposite path. He wondered if this was part of the sixth sense intuition from Chiron's lecture. As Kim followed his intuition and went in the opposite direction, he heard an announcement about Joe Sukman's elimination. Hearing this, Kim wondered why nothing was happening around him while others were encountering and fighting monsters. He found it strange that even his intuition seemed to be avoiding the monsters. He pondered what would happen if he reached 100% intuition, wondering if he would be able to see the future, like anticipating his opponent's attacks three seconds in advance. Lost in his thoughts, Kim was startled when Lee approached him from behind and called his name. Lee warned him to be careful as monsters could pop out any moment. Lee asked if Kim knew something, but Kim denied it, stating that he was simply going in whatever direction he felt like. Lee was taken aback and told him that he would get into trouble if he continued that way. He mentioned the left-hand method, which involved following along the left-hand wall, but Kim dismissed it, saying it would take too long. Kim insisted on going his own way based on his instincts. Lee then told Kim to get lost, prompting Kim to ask why he was following him. Lee explained that they were comrades in a similar situation. He participated alone, and based on what he had observed, he thought Kim had also participated alone. Kim realized why Lee had approached him in the waiting room earlier. Lee believed that weak people should stick together. Kim wondered if Lee saw him as weak and realized that he didn't appear strong from the outside. Lee then showed Kim something exciting on his phone, a photo of his younger sister, and asked if she was cute. Kim found it strange but continued walking in his own way, stating that he wasn't sure about it and would lead his own path. Lee stopped him, expressing concern that it was dangerous to travel alone. Kim wondered if Lee ever felt scared and nervous being alone in a place like this despite being very young. He felt a slight sympathy, but quickly reminded himself that Lee was his competitor. Kim asked Lee if his younger sister and parents had come to cheer him on, implying that he had support, unlike Kim himself. Lee told Kim that his parents had passed away and he only had his younger sister. Upon hearing this, Kim was reminded of his own old memories and found himself becoming slightly emotional. Lee thought he might have made the atmosphere uncomfortable, but Kim reassured him, saying that they were indeed comrades in a similar situation. He invited Lee to follow him if he liked and declared that he would be the one to take the prize money. Kim urged Lee to trust him and let go of his doubts. They proceeded together, and Lee was astonished to see that Kim didn't hesitate at all in his steps. It was as if he already knew the way. They reached a dead end, and Kim wondered if this was the exit. He pushed the wall, and it opened up, revealing a passage beyond. Lee was stunned to witness their success. Meanwhile, an announcement was made that the first person had arrived, leaving everyone astonished by the record-breaking time. They wondered if it could be Jumwon, but Sunbai realized that Jumwon was still in the middle of a battle. They speculated on who else could have broken through. Suigun was also shocked and had a hunch that it might be Kim. On the screen, Kim's name appeared, and he felt disappointed that he hadn't encountered any monsters during his run. As Lee was still lost in his thoughts, he wondered how it had all happened. Meeting Kim and deciding to work together to escape the maze seemed like a dream. Meanwhile, Kim had secured the top spot on the list with Lee in second place. News of completing the maze in 27 minutes spread rapidly, and everyone began discussing the possibility of such an achievement. The fact that a cadet from a relatively unknown academy had acclaimed the first position surprised everyone. In the restrooms, the other participants expressed their astonishment as they had expected Lee Jun won to come in first, but hadn't anticipated him landing in third place. While Kim was listening to his lectures, Lee Jun won approached him and stared at him intently, leaving everyone in a state of shock. Kim couldn't help but wonder if Jun-won had something to do with him, as he scrutinized him from head to toe. Jun-won gave him an annoyed expression and turned away. Kim pondered whether that was all there was to it. People started commenting that he was merely lucky, while Kim remained focused on his work. Just then, a person entered and announced details about the second round of the competition. 
They reveal that the next match would be a 1v1 battle, and the weapons used must have mana injected into them. However, body strengthening with mana was allowed. Ken realized that since 32 people had passed the first round, there would be a total of 32 matches in the second round. As the person was about to disclose the matchups, someone interrupted and declared their intention to forfeit. The scene shifted outside the stadium where Suyun had emerged. She had nearly been caught but managed to escape unnoticed. Seeing Kim win the first round had stunned her, and she decided to wait until things calmed down a bit before returning. As Suyun overheard a group of men talking, she realized they were angry because the tournament was already in the semifinals and all 32 contestants who passed the first round had seemingly forfeited. Someone asked what they meant by everyone forfeiting and Suyun suspected that they might be involved in gambling. A person advised them to give up, stating that Lee Jo Mwon would inevitably win in the end. They sarcastically asked who in their right mind would bet on any other cadet. Suddenly, a mysterious man entered and placed a bet of $1 million on Kim Siu Jun. This shocked everyone, and they commented that he was just a rookie who got lucky in the first round, hailing from some unknown academy called the Dream Academy. Stu even wondered who the mysterious person could be. The scene shifted to the restroom where the atmosphere quickly became dull. Moments ago, most of the participants had forfeited. Lee told Kim that he had heard it was common in League 4 where only the top cadets would emerge victorious. He mentioned a rumor that once Jung Won flipped his switch, he didn't care whether it was a competition or not. He would cripple his opponents. Lee expressed his reluctance to fight Jung Won and said that they would just end up as stepping stones for the prestigious academies if they continued. He believed it would be better to forfeit at that point. As everyone rushed to forfeit, Lee was about to do the same, but he hesitated and took a step back. It turned out that only five of them didn't forfeit. The person announced the opponents for the second stage, pairing Kim against Jang Dukshul for the first round, while Jung Won would face Lee Mingyi. Lee Chulman received a bye. Kim realized that since he had come in first during the first round, he would automatically reach the finals. He noticed that Lee was in tears and trembling with fear. Kim asked why he was so worried about losing before even trying to fight. Lee boasted, asking if Kim wasn't scared, knowing that his opponent was Jung Won. Kim suggested that if he was so concerned, he should forfeit. However, Lee, feeling dejected, said that was something he couldn't do. The person instructed Kim and Jang to head to the arena for their fight. Before leaving, Kim told Lee that if he couldn't forfeit, he might as well fight until the end and perhaps even win. As Kim was about to leave, Lee grabbed his hand and asked if he didn't have any concerns. Kim replied that he had no concerns and wondered how much experience Lee was worth. Lee was left speechless, unable to understand what Kim meant. As Kim confidently entered the arena, the announcement introduced the battlefield, stating that only the toughest would remain. They announced Kim Siu Jun as the first contestant of the battle, and his opponent, Jang Dukshul from the prestigious Gokchuri Academy, entered the ring. Jang laughed and taunted Kim, saying that if he had to face Jang after passing the first round, then Kim must be unlucky. Kim responded, stating that they didn't know who was truly unlucky in that situation. Jang became angry at Kim's statement. The match began and Jang rushed towards Kim, hurling insults at him. The scene shifted to the player's room where Lee was lost in thought, trying to gather himself. He wondered how Kin was faring in the match, but he realized it wasn't the time to worry about others. He had to focus on his upcoming match against Jun. He recalled Kim's words, reminding him not to be concerned about losing before even attempting to fight. Lee was frustrated because it wasn't just about Jun and Jang. They both hailed from prestigious academies and cadets from no-name academies that they couldn't compare to them. He contemplated forfeiting. Everyone in the room was stunned by the outcome of the match. He realized that the result had been decided in the blink of an eye. The winner was none other than Kim Siu Jun from the Dream Academy. Jang was lying on the ground, defeated, while Kim stood victorious before him. Jung commented disdainfully that those pieces of trash were enjoying themselves. Then he glanced at Lee, who was frozen in front of him, unable to react. The scene depicted what actually happened during Kang and Kim's fight. When Jang rushed towards Kim with his immense strength, Kim skillfully dodged the attack using his sixth sense, showcasing that his success wasn't solely due to luck. Jang became confused as he realized his continuous attacks were fugal and he was reaching the point of exhaustion. On the other hand, Kim effortlessly evaded his attacks as if they were insignificant. Jang grew desperate, attempting a powerful attack with confidence. As he swung his axe to strike Kim, Kim countered with his spear, causing Jang to lose his weapon. Taking advantage of the opening, Kim defeated Jang, who ended up crawling on the ground. In the blink of an eye, the match was decided and Kim emerged as the winner. As he made his way to the player's room, he felt a sense of disappointment. The lecture he attended didn't provide as much improvement as he had anticipated. He pondered what he could do if he fought against the other cadets and realized that the expiration of the free pass was approaching. 
Once it expired, he wouldn't be able to purchase weapons anymore. He concluded that he had no choice but to win the prize money. Upon entering the room, Lee rushed in and expressed surprise at witnessing Kim's strength. The announcer then summoned the contestants for the second match. Jum stood up and rudely bumped into Ki, instructing him to move aside. Lee asked Kim if he remembered when they said they were alike in the maze. He mentioned feeling a sense of kinship towards Kim now and confessed that he felt happy when Kim defeated Jang. He even admitted to being jealous and expressed his desire to become an older brother his sister would be proud of. As he left, Kim encouraged him to do his best, and with a smile, Kim said they should meet in the finals. As they reached the battle arena, facing each other, Lee was nervous, but he tried to convince himself that he could do it. Jean expressed annoyance at Lee's mumbling, finding it bothersome. He also revealed his embarrassment at being forced to participate in the tournament. The referee entered and began explaining the rules before the fight. Jung glared at Lee, who trembled in fear. Jung thought to himself that even without fighting, he could clearly see that Lee was a useless prey, meant to be devoured, a creature at the bottom of the food chain. To Jung, a talented predator like himself, Lee was nothing more than fodder. Jung concluded that Lee had simply gotten lucky and needed to know his place. He was infuriated that he wasn't placed first in the first tournament, as he believed he was on a completely different level than the others. Seeing Lee standing with his sword ready, Jung grew even more angry, wondering if Lee truly believed he could win. The announcer commenced the second round of the tournament. Lee maintained his confidence, which further annoyed Jung. Jung thought there was no need to prolong the fight and rushed towards Kim, hoping to finish it with a single blow. As he struck, Lee barely defended himself. Jung taunted him, calling him a pest and instructing him to act like one. He forcefully struck Lee's chest with the back of his sword, delivering a powerful blow that caused Lee to cough up blood. Lee knelt in pain, wondering if this was the end of the match. He considered himself defeated, realizing he was no match for Jun. Feeling despondent, he questioned whether he was truly incapable of doing anything. Even though Lee had resolved to become a brother his sister could be proud of and hoped to become strong like Kim, Lee found himself on the ground after an attack. Everyone had expected Jun to be the only victor, as they believed he was on a different level that he shouldn't even compete. However, to everyone's surprise, Lee had struck Jun in the face, causing him to bleed. Jun was infuriated that Lee's attack had reached him and glared at him in anger. Jun then informed the referee that he would forfeit the match. The referee asked for clarification, and in response, Jun turned and kicked Lee in the head with his knee. He expressed his frustration with the tournament, calling it trash because they accepted fools like Lee. The referee warned Jun to stop or face consequences, but Jun scoffed at the idea, stating that the action they would take would be him asking for a forfeit. He accused Lee and others like him of crawling without knowing their place. Jung placed his foot on Lee's head and prepared to swing his sword at him. However, Kim stepped in to defend Lee, stating that he had been waiting for Jun in the finals. But then he changed his mind, realizing that Lee deserved to be beaten at that moment. Kim told Jun to remove his foot from Lee's head. When Jun asked what would happen if he refused, Kim swung his spear, causing Jun to step back. Kim then checked on Lee to see if he was conscious. Kim questioned Jun, asking if it was enjoyable for him to look down on others and why he would trample on someone like that. Jun replied, stating that it was repulsive to see someone insignificant not knowing their place. Kim retorted, asking if Jun believed that pests couldn't dream. Jun laughed, stating that he didn't realize people still talked about unrealistic things in this day and age. The argument continued to escalate and people wondered why the organizers were not intervening. It was revealed that the referee had received orders from above not to stop them. Suyum, observing the situation, expressed her concern and realized that Jun was even more foolish than she had thought. Jun declared that he would teach Kim a lesson about the world, describing it as a place where only the capable succeed and survival is achieved by crushing others. He claimed that there was no room for dreams in this process and that it was the harsh reality of people in the world. Kim reflected on his past, realizing that he used to think similarly to Jun. Throughout the nine arduous years he had endured to become a professional hunter, he faced the harsh realities of life. He had resented himself for lacking money, talent, and the ability to do anything. Kim concluded that his hard work had only helped him maintain his current state, but it had never truly improved his circumstances. He then instructed the referee to take care of Lee. Kim rolled towards Jun, asserting that his actions couldn't be dismissed or treated lightly. He dashed towards Jun despite the referee warning him about rule violations. Jun found it amusing considering it a joke. As Kim attacked with his swinging spear, Jun defended himself with a smile, calling it a lesson. Kim retorted that Jun was the true pest. Jun began swinging his sword and Kim barely managed to dodge the attacks. Kim realized Jun's skills were impressive, explaining why people held him in high regard. Feeling like he might lose, Kim refocused his mind and relied on his instincts to move accordingly. Finding an opening, 
He struck Jun in the gut with his spear, causing them both to step back. The referee attempted to intervene, but Jun screamed at him, demanding that he stay out of it. Jun proclaimed himself as the predator that rules over his prey, but he was angered by the way Kim looked at him with predator-like eyes despite being just a pest. In a quick move, Jun dashed towards Kim, eager to see how he would fare against reality. He swung his sword, and surprisingly, Kim blocked the attack. Jun wondered if it was his imagination or if Kim was becoming more proficient. Kim successfully blocked more of Jun's attacks, giving Jun the impression that a monster was growing before him. Kim pushed Jun away with his own attack, but he also suffered a hit. Jun became furious, realizing that Kim was truly pushing him. Jun then drew his sword and infused it with mana, as Kim saw that he was afraid because he didn't know how to control mana. As the organizers rushed to stop him, Jun made up his mind to finish off Kim. Meanwhile, Kim contemplated running away, realizing it was the best course of action, but he questioned why his brain knew he should run when he didn't want to. He felt that running would mean denying everything he had built up until that point. At that moment, he heard Xiang Yu's voice, recounting how he had heard of the glory of the Chu dynasty and still jumped into the enemy lines alone. Despite the result being a lost cause with no chance of survival, Xiang Yu had been afraid, but he fought anyway. Shang Yu asked Kim if he knew why, to which Kim replied that it was because he had to do something. Shang Yu encouraged him to fight like crazy and believe in his victory. Filled with courage, they both shouted that the spirit that overturns the world would dominate it. They strode towards each other and Jum attacked Kim with killing intent. As their weapons clashed, the air around them vibrated and a bright light emerged, momentarily blinding everyone. The scene was filled with dust and everyone eagerly awaited the outcome of the fight. Slowly as the dust settled, both of them were standing, but suddenly Jun fell to the ground while Kim stood tall. As everyone was stunned to see Kim's victory over Jun, Su Yun was particularly amazed because she had witnessed him barely facing off against a mana-injected sword just two weeks ago, and now he could create an aura spear. Su Yun felt proud of Kim. Her eyes caught sight of a mysterious man again, the one she had seen at the gambling center. When his cap fell off, he screamed, expressing disbelief. Su Yun thought his reaction was excessive and remembered that he had bet on Kim's win. When she turned to look at him again, he had disappeared. The scene shifted to the evening, where tired and disappointed Kim walked down the street. He had been disqualified because of his intervention in the fight between him and Lee Jun Won. Kim asked what would happen to Jun, and the organizers replied that he would also be disqualified. Furthermore, Jun's action of using an aura sword against his opponent would lead to prosecution and a five-year ban from participating in the Pro Hunter exam. The results were announced, declaring that Lee Choman had won the first tournament by default, with Lee Ming ending up in second place and Jang in third. Kim stated that it was fine because his lecture progress had improved significantly. He noticed that Xiang Yu's lecture progress rate had surpassed 50% and wondered if the strange power he had felt back then was the reason for it. As he walked, Su Yun approached him from behind and called his name. She asked about his condition and Kim replied that he was feeling pretty sturdy. Su Yun felt relieved and Kim apologized to her. Su Yun told him there was no need to apologize, but Kim expressed regret because he could have won if he hadn't intervened. Su Yun reassured him and asked if he was okay. Lin questioned why he wouldn't be okay, and Su Yun explained that she thought he had been interested in the prize money. Kim remembered and started crying over it. Seeing his distress, Su Yun asked him what he planned to do with the money. Kim replied that there was a weapon he had been longing for and intended to buy. He then reassured himself, saying that he still had regrets but believed the money problem would somehow resolve itself. As they were about to leave, Lee came up from behind, panting, and called out to Kim. He asked if they were leaving. Kim confirmed that it was the plan. Lee paused for a moment, catching his breath, and asked if he could become like Kim if he worked hard. Kim saw the bright light on Lee's face and replied that it would be difficult for him. Kim realized that he needed to tell Lee the truth, that he was still far behind in becoming a pro hunter. Although it was said that nothing is impossible with hard work, the world is a harsh place that can't be overcome with just dreams and ideals. Kim advised Lee not to get fixated on becoming a hunter alone, as he could be good at something else. Lee agreed with Kim, but deep down, he was disappointed. They bid each other goodbye, and as Lee was about to leave, he thanked Kim. Kim told him not to let anyone, including himself, get to him and not to let them tell him that he can't do it. He acknowledged that it's undeniable that Lee lacks talent, and that's what people will say when they see him, but Lee should never let them say that he will never succeed. Kim encouraged him to go after what he wishes for. Lee sobbed, and after a while, Kim left, saying goodbye. Suvin expressed her surprise at seeing this side of Kim and considered it a good thing that he has a fan. Kim responded that maybe being a student would have been better for her than being a fan. Suvin realized that she should have invited him to join the academy. She realized that her academy would be flourishing now. Touched, she told Kim that since he had worked hard, she would bring him a weapon. 
She informed him about her grandfather's workshop and asked him to go there, mentioning that she would let him choose an expensive one. As the scene shifted, a person walked in and asked if the headmaster was present. The attendant informed him that the headmaster was currently in meditation and advised not to disturb him. The person insisted that it was an emergency and opened the door, revealing he'd be Moonshul, the close aide of Swordstar. Swordstar, annoyed by the interruption, questioned if his orders were being ignored. Moonshul felt an overwhelming pressure that rendered him unable to move. He informed Swordstar that Suyun had participated in the recent academy tournament. Swordstar took this information into account and considered that she had recruited a new student. Moonshul offered to take care of the matter, but Swordstar stood up and rejected his offer, stating that he would personally need to see what kind of person this new student was. The scene began with Kim swinging his spear and counting his movements. Suddenly, he felt a sharp gaze behind him, and when he turned around, he saw Suyun standing there. Suyun expressed her frustration that Kim seemed to be overly picky about changing his equipment. She had taken him to the workshop, but didn't buy anything. Kim explained that he felt it was a bit excessive, but Suyum insisted that he shouldn't care about others' opinions and that she had offered to buy it for him as a rare opportunity. Suyun asked Kim about the type of mana creation he used, leaving him confused as he didn't understand what she was referring to. Suyun explained that he needed to learn mana creation techniques to effectively handle mana. She mentioned that based on his fight against the monster and his combat style, it seemed like he had a basic understanding of mana, but he hadn't learned any specific mana cultivation techniques yet. Kim inquired if Suyun taught the Sword Star's mana cultivation technique in the academy, but she denied it, mentioning that her grandfather strictly forbade it. Kim wasn't surprised and realized that if they had learned the Sword Star's technique, they would be much more successful. Suyun revealed that instead, she taught her own mana technique, which left Kim stunned. He asked if she had created it herself, and Suyun questioned why he was so curious about it. Kim explained that he was simply intrigued, but deep down, he didn't expect Suyun to possess such talent or be on par with the Sword Star. He realized that mana cultivation was fundamental for hunters, as he experienced the difference between being able to use mana and not during his fight with Joan. Kim decided that since he had some free time, taking another lecture on mana seemed like a good idea. As Suyu noticed Kim lost in thought, she left encouraging him to continue training. Kim asked her where she was going before she departed. Suyu replied that she had some business to attend to and left the academy. Kim wondered when his mentor would appear, as they would be very helpful to him right now. The scene shifted to Kim attending a mana lecture, where mana was described as a force that could disrupt and overturn the laws of the world governed by strict causality. The instructor of the lecture was the Archmage Merlin, and Kim was in awe of him. After finishing the lecture, Merlin assigned Kim a daily task of manifesting 1,000 mana orbs. Kim felt disappointed, realizing that it was also a daily task. Nonetheless, he stood up determined to give it a try. As he attempted to manipulate mana, he found it challenging to initiate but realized that it might be due to Chiron's lecture. While Kim could sense the presence of mana, he struggled to bring it forth. Merlin advised him to connect his mind with the physical world and convince the world to manifest the mana. He used the prime example that the strong power was unique. Kim attempted to generate mana orbs and was amazed to see a bright glowing light appear between his palms. However, the orbs turned out to be very small in size, which he felt might not meet the requirement for the daily task. Kim hoped to become more proficient with time. Suddenly, the Sword Star entered the scene. Startled, Kim asked about his identity and the Sword Star, whose name was Park, expressed surprise that Kim hadn't heard of him. Park explained that he had come to see who the new student at the academy was. Observing the mana orbs in Kim's hand, Park realized that it was a difficult task and that Kim, despite appearing slow, possessed exceptional talent. He wondered if Kim had any ulterior motives and was scheming to use his granddaughter to gain entry to the Dream Academy. As Park asked about Kim's identity, Kim greeted him and introduced himself. Kim was startled as he hadn't expected Suyun's grandfather to suddenly appear. He mentioned that he had seen Park on the internet and felt amazed to see him in person. Kim asked if Park was there to see Suyun and Park replied that she had left for a business matter a while ago. Park gasped slightly and Kim asked if he was there for Suyun. Park questioned how Kim remained unfazed, mentioning that he had just emanated a killing intent that should have paralyzed anyone who wasn't an S-class hunter. Kim wondered if it was due to his unwavering heart. Park then asked about Kim's objective, but Kim didn't fully understand his question. Kim replied that someone with his talent would be welcomed anywhere and questioned the main reason for getting close to Suyun. Park approached Kim, gripping his sword, and demanded that Kim tell him the truth. Kim became nervous and started screaming, insisting that there must be a huge misunderstanding. Park grew furious, drew his sword, and swung at Kim, who barely managed to dodge the attack. The scene shifted to the Sword Star's location, where Suyun had arrived and was searching for her grandfather. When she asked the workers about him, 
they informed her that they didn't have any details and suggested that Councilman Muchel might know. Sirion felt sadness as she wanted to speak with her grandfather and wondered where he might have gone. Meanwhile, Park continued to attack Kim, persisting in his demand for the truth about Kim's objective. As Sue even wondered where her grandfather had gone, she realized that she couldn't hide Kim any longer after his participation in the tournament. She decided to confront the issue head-on. Just then, Muchel entered and called out to Suyun, remarking that seeing her at the land house was a rare sight. Suyun mentioned that she was about to contact him and explain that she had come to visit her grandfather. Muchel appeared nervous and revealed that the headmaster had gone to her academy. Hearing this, Suyun's eyes widened and she quickly ran towards her academy. Muchel wondered why she had rushed off like that, while Suyun realized that she had let her guard down, expecting her grandfather to visit her at some point, but not this soon. Meanwhile, Park continued to attack Kim. Kim realized that all this time Park had been swinging his sword without unsheathing it, indicating that he intended to restrain Kim rather than finish him off. As Park approached him and questioned his true identity, Kim replied that he didn't know why Park was doing this and insisted that it was all a misunderstanding. As Park claimed that Kim was just a foul liar, he swung his sword again, but Kim blocked the attack and insisted that he didn't know what Suyun had told Park. He urged Park to calm down, but Park was still furious, accusing Kim of not considering his circumstances and calling him a liar. Kim realized that Park wouldn't listen to him and understood from his words that Park didn't intend to finish him off. If Park had wanted to kill him, he wouldn't be standing there. Kim recognized that Sword Star was the person closest to his ideal, and he saw this encounter as a great opportunity. Park noticed that Kim's demeanor had changed and was amazed. He had encountered countless hunters throughout his life, but Kim was the only one whose fierce eyes remained unaffected even after facing him. Park wondered if Kim was exceptionally skilled. Park dashed towards Kim, swinging his sword, and demanded to know why Kim had approached his granddaughter. Kim realized that even with Park's simple strikes, he was on a whole different level that Kim couldn't even fathom. At this point, Kim simply wanted to test how long he could last against Park's attacks. As Kim tried to use tricks and dash towards Park, the sword stars swiftly attacked him in the gut, calling him Maeve. Park insisted that Kim must answer his questions instead of trying to deceive him. Kim knew he couldn't let it end there and realized that this was his only chance while Park was going easy on him. He understood that he would only get one shot and had to finish it in one blow. As Park swung his sword at him, Kim dodged the attack and infused his spear with mana, recalling Merlin's words. He struck at Park with his spear, proclaiming that it was the best he could do. However, the attack had no effect on the sword star and Kim found himself kneeling on the ground in pain. Park stated that Kim had finally shown his true colors, and Kim shouted back, reminding Park that he was the one who had attacked first. Kim anxiously wondered when Suyun would arrive and Park became infuriated, calling her by her name and threatening to personally deliver Kim's death if that's what he truly desired. Kim realized that he was in serious trouble. Meanwhile, Suyun entered the scene and demanded that they stop. She was furious to see her grandfather there and asked him what he was doing. As Suyun looked at Kim, she asked if he was okay and expressed her concern for his bruised condition. Park commented on Kim being so weak and mocked him for calling himself a man. Kim responded by questioning whether gender mattered when being beaten up by the sword star. This angered Park, who screamed at him, and Kim asked if he was going to hurt him again. Suyun was amazed by Kim's boldness, as she had never seen anyone talk back to the sword star like that. Kim further asked if he even knew why he was being beaten up in the first place, and if being the sword star meant he could do whatever he pleased. Suhyun intervened, telling her grandfather to stop, and she apologized to Kim for the ordeal he had to go through. Kim reassured her, saying that his injuries were not serious and there was no need for apologies. However, Suhyun bowed in front of him, promising to explain later and sincerely apologize. Kim was left speechless for a moment, and then he stated that he should at least get his injuries checked at the hospital. Suyun assured him not to worry about the cost of treatment, thanked him for understanding, and gave an angry look to her grandfather as Kim left for the hospital. Meanwhile, Suyun decided it was time to confront her grandfather, but when she stood in front of him, she couldn't bring herself to speak. Her grandfather told her that Kim was highly suspicious and advised her not to get close to him. Suyun insisted that Kim was not suspicious at all, but her grandfather dismissed her opinion, reminding her of his tendency to suppress her with his words and disregard her thoughts. Even her hunter academy, which she had founded, was not free from her grandfather's interference, as he would cause trouble whenever she admitted new students. Suyun understood why her grandfather behaved this way as he could see people's hidden motives. Frustrated, she screamed that she didn't want to wrap things up by tomorrow, but her grandfather angrily questioned what she had just said. As Suyun continued to scream, she expressed her unwillingness to let him go and questioned why she had to do what he said. She asserted that the academy was hers, not his. 
Filled with emotions, Suyun admitted to herself that she hadn't formed any previous memories or special feelings towards him, but she had an odd feeling whenever she watched him, which made her want to be with him. Her grandfather responded by telling her not to throw tantrums and claiming that she didn't know him. Suyun asked him, so what if she didn't know him? She expressed her desire to find out who he truly was and declared that she couldn't live under his shadow forever. After a brief pause, she apologized for raising her voice but asserted that she wouldn't listen to him anymore. Park, witnessing Suyun's behavior, was stunned and wondered if she had ever voiced her opinion so strongly before. Park recalled the time when he had lost his son in a dungeon break and he was left with Suyun who was alone. He made the decision that she needed the strength to defend herself even if she didn't like swordsmanship and wanted to become a teacher. He admitted to himself that he had wanted to hear her voice and had intentionally oppressed her all these years, knowing that the emotional distance between them was growing wider. This was the result of his actions. The scene shifted outside where Kim walked out of the hospital feeling completely fine. He remarked that the daily task would not be a problem for him, reflecting on how the other day he thought he was going to pass out, but fortunately, it was just bruises. He acknowledged that the sword star had gone easy on him, but if Suyun hadn't arrived, the outcome could have been much worse. Kim pondered over Suyun's backstory, realizing that she had called him last night to share her current relationship with her grandfather and what had happened to previous students. Although he was certain that she hadn't told him everything, he could understand her feelings. Kim wondered why the sword star had been hostile towards him, acknowledging that understanding didn't excuse the rudeness. He suggested that he should somehow get an apology from him. Despite that, he felt his progress in the lessons had improved. As he entered the room, he felt nervous, wondering if the sword star was going to beat him up again. As Kim entered and sat down, Park remarked that he had heard about the deal he made with Suyo and asked if that was the whole story. Kim replied affirmatively, stating that there was nothing to hide in the first place. Park couldn't sense any signs of deception from Kim but still wondered about his powers and strength as a mere cadet shouldn't be able to display such abilities. However, Park found himself getting angrier whenever he saw Kim without understanding the reason behind it. Kim asked if Park had anything else to say, suggesting that he should leave if not. Park inquired where Kim was going, to which Kim responded that he was about to train. Park thought that if he could observe Kim training, he might be able to uncover what he was hiding. However, after some time, Park became uncertain about something and wondered if Kim was in the right state of mind seeing him staring at a black screen for hours. He asked Kim if he was meditating and Kim replied that he was doing something similar. As Sword Star gave him a lecture, saying that meditating is definitely good training and that meditation is all about strengthening his mind and soul, Kim just nodded in agreement. Park wondered if Kim had no interest at all in his teaching. He asked Kim if he wanted him to teach him, to which Kim immediately questioned if he wanted to personally teach him. Park thought to himself that he had expected that immediate response, thinking that although Kim hurt his pride, he could still instruct him a bit. However, Kim denied it, saying he wasn't interested and asked Park to talk to him later. While they were talking, Suyun entered and was stunned to see her grandpa there. Her grandpa said she had arrived just in time. Suyun asked why he had visited again and if he was trying to bully Kim once more. Park replied that he thought Kim was not in the right state of mind and mentioned that Kim had said he didn't want his teaching. Suyun asked what exactly was weird as she saw Kim. Park was amazed and asked if everything Kim was doing seemed strange to her. Suyun wondered if her grandpa thought it was weird now just as she used to think before. She went towards Kim, greeted him, and asked about his body. As they talked, Park observed them and clearly didn't like Kim at all. He felt that Kim was just talking nonsense while Suyun was enjoying it and couldn't stop smiling. He wondered if their conversation was really that enjoyable. Park thought that he had never seen his daughter, Suyun, smiling in such a way before. As he grew angry seeing Kim indulging with Suyun, he was about to say something when Muchul came in, calling for Park. Park asked what the matter was and Muchul replied that he came to deliver some urgent news. He said that the Order of the Truth had called and requested a meeting with Sword Star. Park concluded that it was unnecessary and suggested that if they really wanted something, they should come visit him instead. However, Muchul informed him that Kalia specifically requested the meeting. Upon hearing this, Park asked if Kalia personally came. Moonshul confirmed that Sir Kalia had indeed requested the presence of someone named Kim Sujun as well. Kim wondered if he was the one Kalia wanted to see and Park asked him if he was one of the truth's people, questioning how Kalia would know about him. Kim replied that he was also curious about it. Suyun noticed that she had spotted a person in black during the academy contest and speculated that he might be involved. Park found it strange because there was no reason for Kalia to take an interest in Kim. Su so even asked if he knew anything about Kalia, and Kim replied that he had no idea. He then asked if he really had to go. Su so was stunned by his question and reminded him that it was an order from the Order of the Truth. She explained that among them were the seven apostles who held the same authority as the head of the state. 
As she explained, Sir Kalia is the successor to the currently vacant position. Kim asked why it mattered to him since he was just a foreigner who didn't know anyone. Moonchul asked if this was why they spoke so highly of Sir Kalia. Park asked what he meant, and Moonchul revealed that Sir Kalia had already anticipated Kim's rejection of the request and had prepared a message in case that happened. Moonchul shared the message, stating that just by attending the meeting, Kim would receive a reward of $1 million. Kim wondered how Sir Kalia knew that he was in need of such an amount. We then received an introduction to the Order of Truth. Rather than believing in a deity created by humans, they were a religious order that worshipped the truth itself as their god. They claimed that their words were the truth, hence the words of God. In historical context, about a century ago, the Order of Truth was considered a mere cult. However, during a cataclysmic event, they played a significant role in restoring peace by joining forces with heroes, particularly during the subjugation of the giant monster known as Berserk. When people started believing that the end of the cataclysm was near, this powerful monster appeared. Despite the desperate situation, only the Grand Voice and the Seven Apostles were able to defeat the monster, becoming key figures in ending the cataclysm. That wraps up this part, but there's more to come. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next exciting chapter.